We'll get to chapter one. Matter of fact, before you leave, we just will go ahead and get to at least the uh, first part of chapter one. This is what we're going to try to get to. Let, let's pray in your mind. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come together and worship and praise your holy name. Father, we thank you, Lord, for coming and being with us. Because you say when two or three gather your name, you've been in the midst of us. Father, we see the work that we need to be done. We ask Heavenly Father to lead us and guide us and prepare us and equip all of us who hear the word of God, either on this video or in this session, Lord, to be able to go out and do your work. Father, I thank you for all you're about to do, and we can get into your word at the time we have left. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What I want to do right here, uh, finish up, Chris, uh, let me finish this and then we go to chapter one. The, I, I told you it was, we had five keys, we've already been the three other keys, and we were basically given that foundation of, uh, of scripture, we went to Daniel, went to the abomination and desolation and so forth. The other is, is, is the key four is informational chapters, which is what uh, Bishop was just talking about. He said the remaining chapters are not necessarily a, a to the continuity of the two unfolding stories, Daniel Revelation, but add information. So the scripture he was talking about, like informational chapters 7, 10 through 15, 17, 18, chapter 20, 21, and 22, describes events occurring after the seven year period. The thousand year reign of Christ the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. And did I put it here? This is, uh, did I put that twice? Mm -hmm. Okay, key four says, deals with, it should be key five, deal with past, present, and future events. The remaining chapters are necessarily eight to, that is repeating it. No, I put two things in there. Uh, Revelation 9, 119 says, write these things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Historians and futurists, in the, in the theological world, there are two major schools of thoughts concerning the interpretation of Revelation. The historian declares an attempt to show that events in history have already fulfilled the prophecy of Revelation. He concludes that Revelation is of no significance to us today, which is wrong. But that's what historians and futuristics try to do. Well, you, he, know, you do realize that the guy who developed the futuristic view mm. was a Catholic. Oh, really? It wasn't an acquaintance, was it? Uh, what's that guy's name? <laughs> who was it? You just need to know that the Catholic Church has two gods that they, that they sponsor to develop you will Really? Look at that. That's not it. I'm like, they got the Catholic theologian. Oh, yeah. The guys who believe that <clears throat> everything has already happened and has no relevance to them, mm -hmm. he's Catholic. Mm -hmm. The guy that believes that everything points to something that's going to happen in the future, he's Catholic. They both. Sponsored by Captain <laughs> I like what he thought about Captain don't play, man. They ain't play, right? They don't play. <laughs> and they got and they about they got all that research material. He said the other one, if they you sold it off. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. He said, if the events of Revelation have already come to pass, we are living in a glorious one this is the futuristic or somebody said already oh, have futuristic one thousand year reign of righteousness and peace on earth. A reign of peace does not describe a condition of the earth today. The historical events of Revelation ties the future to the past and further establish the Bible as a complete record of God's plan. The futurist teacher teaches the futurist teaches that events in chapter four to twenty two are unfulfilled. Mm -hmm. Both the historian and futurists have overlooked the reference to past, present, and future in Revelation one nineteen. Now you know what that does? If you go and look at church history, you, you think we should lady, you think we should lady named Ellen G. White? Seven Day of Venice. Seven Day of Venice. Ellen G. White, every one of those guys from, they got that wrote the 95 Thesis, mm -hmm. all them early writers, every last one of them said the Catholic Church was the Antichrist. Oh, wow. 
So I believe like the last pope would be the Antichrist. Oh. Who was yep. Charles Spurgeon. The Catholic Church is the Antichrist. At least the Babylon, right? No, the because whore. that kind of goes into what when when he said the thing about they want you to be Southern Baptist Catholic. Yeah. That's your mark you gotta take. Yeah. Mm. You go through all this here? Yeah. The Catholic. Yeah. Right. Now. But if these things are already happened, ain't no finger pointing to the Catholic Church. Right. If these things are yet to be, uh -huh. ain't no finger pointing to the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, so he didn't like you said. Yeah. So everything, real smart. Listen, look. All we gotta do is to get the spotlight off of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially that's what they did the dog game. If it's already happened, we can do whatever we want to do. Which Revelation is, already fulfilled. What y'all talking about? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. What y'all looking at that for? Like we talking about Antichrist? Antichrist already done come and go. <laughs> <laughs> and they can sit there and show like the Inquisition. He was he yeah. was there during the Inquisition. And, and they know they had some bad Catholic uh, priests and oh, oh. So we're talking about the Jesuits now. Uh -oh. Woo! The current Pope is Jesuit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he is. Mm -hmm. You want that joke? Go get some stuff done. Yeah. Did he not, didn't, didn't he take the guy play who resigned? Yeah. Yeah, but that did, yeah. What, 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 I know you real now, brother. I know you real. Now, I know it's going to be a resurrection. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we're going, to get, we're going to get to chapter one. We're going to get to the beginning of chapter one is what I'm trying to get to. It says, uh, uh, no contradiction. The Bible is composed of 66 volumes written by 40 men of God over a period of more than 1,600 1, years. The Bible continue, continuity is superb, despite what liberal theologians have said, usually to cover their own lack of understanding, there are not contradictions in the Bible. And in the summary, I just say here's the keys. Key one, the central theme of Revelation is the reveal of Jesus Christ. Key two, Jesus' servants ought to understand this revelation, meaning us. Key three, the stories other events in heaven and on earth during the tribulation period are woven around the central theme of Jesus. Key four, informational child provides more details about the stories of heaven and earth. And then key five, the events of revelation occurs in the past, present, and future. But the book itself. Okay, so uh, you guys remember this thing called uh, 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 CIT? You remember CIT? CIT is. This is an analysis thing for studying material. Theologians do this. Mm -hmm. A CRT is, is a, what they call the central idea of the text. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. I like that. Okay. Central idea of the text. You take you take a piece of you take a piece of literature. It doesn't just apply to the Bible. Mm -hmm. Take a piece of literature. You get a certain section of it that is dedicated one piece, and then you read through it, and you get the meaning of it, the it, the essence of the meaning of it, and then you write a statement that. That, de that describe what that meaning is in a very brief synopsized you know piece yeah so basically you take a piece of literature reduce it down to its fundamental meaning and then you use that to under as, as the means of going through and all this, like you go through a book yeah if you can take all them paragraphs and break them down and get the, the fundamental meaning of each one of those pieces then you got the meaning of the book mm -hmm. Okay. And that's how they say. That's how say. That's how they say they use that for Bible study. The theologians said that's how Bible study ought to be done. Interesting. So you take one of the parable that Jesus said, and then you go through the parable, and then when you finish, you give one synopsized statement. This is what that means. Now, so I thought about that, and here's what I discovered was an amazing thing for us. Uh -huh. Now I've been reading Revelation for a long time. Yeah. I decided to write a CIT for the whole book. Whoa. 
Which which was it Jesus? Was it like what the whole book? Okay. What is God saying in this whole book? Well, you know, it's interesting when you said it, and now I'm gonna let you go ahead and say it, but it's, it's the that ghost says it's all about Jesus. Okay. Now, so I guess this is some fun, this is basic thinking. Now, this is a man. It's the, every man has a right to think his own way through the scripture. I probably will. We, we, we follow what other folks think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like to read what other folks think, but God keeps pressing me. What do you think? So, that seven seal book, when I looked at it, that book, when it's first introduced, is seen in the hand of God. Nothing is said about its origin. Nothing is said about who wrote it. Nothing is said about where it comes from. But I, but I would think that it is reasonable to believe that that book has everything to do with Jesus. Okay. Mm -hmm. And since Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that this book. See, the moment that God decided that Jesus needed to take on flesh to be manifested in time to redeem man, to res be resurrected and ascend it back, all of this, all of this happens before it ever happens. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Paul yeah. Rosa, he went down to the end <laughs> and did everything, then he came back and said, let's, let's get started. Right, right. Because what does it mean when it says, it's a lamb appeared as it had been slain. This is the lamb that they talk about that was slain before the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. What's that what does that mean? Yeah. Well what's it mean this before the foundation of the world? So I believe that I believe that the lamb was slain. Yeah. And God's vindication and judgment against those who reject his coming. You see, I believe the wrath of God is going to be poured out. All the ungodliness really is born out of the fact. It's not so much that God has a problem with ungodliness. God has a problem with the solution to ungodliness has been rejected. That is his Christ. Okay. You hear me? Hmm. And so Jesus said, this is the condemnation of the nation. That light. I have come into the world. And y'all will reject me. With it, yeah. And so Revelation is a really a, a significant part of Revelation is about is about God now vindicating his lamb. Mm. Mm. Okay. It's about God vindicating his lamb by bringing a complete end to the first creation. Right. Because it is the first creation that the Lamb is sent to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the process now of vindicating the Lamb and, bring, and, and, and dealing with the old creation that rejected the Lamb, he's going to begin his new creation. That's what the new heaven and new heaven and earth yeah. is all about. Right. So he's going to bring an end to right. one creation yeah. he's going to birth forth a new one. Right. In the process of vindicating the Lamb and the rejection of the Lamb, he is going to still seek to get out of the old creation every soul they can get out before he is destroyed. Right, yeah. So the gospel is going to be preached while, the, while all hell is breaking loose. Yes, sir. This world is going to be going crazy, and the gospel is still going to be proclaimed. Yeah. Because he's going to say, look, if you think about what's happening in Revelation, all God is trying to do, I think, this is leaving can't think in it. All them seal, all those trumpets, all those vials, all those things that are happening, all of those catastrophes that are happening to the earth, is God seeking to maneuver man to a place what he can acknowledge, I was wrong. I was wrong. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. <laughs> I was wrong. He is the Christ. Yeah. You are the only true God. You are the Creator, and give a joke a chance to repent. Yes. That is the sole purpose of pain. Mm. Like a snake bit. Uh huh. See, see, God. I look at the wisdom of pain and design. Yeah. If listen, God does know that a human being can only stand so much pain. Right. There is a point that if, if enough pain is allowed in your life, everything around you will become irrelevant and all of the pain is Ooh. relevant to you. The, the affection go, does, it, what, does the affection come to be oh no pain? <laughs> Let me tell you something. Change the affection, won't it? <laughs> Let me tell you something. I don't know if you ever had any real serious pain, but pain Ooh. will get your attention like no, not nothing else. <laughs> 
So he sends all these catastrophes on the earth. He's, he's, been, he's destroying economies. He's, he's taking away water. He's bringing, he's giving beasts that can torment men to the point where they, they want to die. Can't die. Can't die. Woo. All of them joking to come to realize. Woo. All, all you got to do is realize that you were wrong about me and about my Christ. And if you do that, you can get out of this thing. But you can't. That, that's the whole thing about it. Uh-huh. So it really is an interesting thing when you start thinking about it. Because what I realized, all the years I read this book, because I was so caught up in looking at the color of the horse. <laughs> what the beast number one. What you really need to understand is what is God trying to tell us big picture-wise in this book. Right. And every, every, every one of us, are, I think, are obligated yeah. to study that book enough to begin to allow the Spirit of God to influence our thinking about Here's the question I ask about Revelation. It's a very simple question. What is God doing? Yeah. That's my question when I read the book. What is he doing? He did a couple of things at the same time, right? He's dealing with Israel, and he's trying to call man to, well, in this case, he's telling us right now to, to preach this gospel and try to get as many people in as possible. Yeah, but he, he's trying to get out. He's telling, he come to the street, he come, he come to destroy the whole thing now. Yeah, yeah. He's just trying to, he, listen, man was not created to be destroyed. He, God looks at man always, even in, even all that rebellious, blasphemous stuff they do. Man, he does understand that this creature is created in my image. And if that rascal can receive light of truth, he still got a chance. He still got a chance. Because even the angel's going to be preaching the chance. gospel during the time of tribulation. I mean, the angel's going to be flying I wonder around. about that. Uh, the angels don't know about no salvation. Well, they said, don't take that seal. They going around flying around saying, do not take the mark of the beast. I, nowhere, nowhere <laughs> in the scripture have we ever known that the gospel was committed to be preached by the angel. That's interesting. Yeah, except for Revelation. That this gospel is supposed to be proclaimed by those who be partakers of it. Right. So what I took from that when I saw this angel proclaiming the gospel, I said, well, they must not make nobody else present to proclaim it. Ooh. Oh Lord, <laughs> what they? <laughs> why else? Why he, he, he listen? Woo! He sent two witnesses down there to prophesy for, yeah, for he, a period of time. Right. Oh. So why? So why now does he resort to having an angel flying through the air proclaiming the gospel to those that are on the earth? Now, if that now, if you ever want to talk about a clear instance of that, might be an indicator right. that that those who no God in the way of salvation and by grace uh -huh. are no longer present. That might be a key indicator at that point. But that happened way down in the book. Yeah, it does. It does, right. That, that's way down in the book that happened. Right. After but I, this angel is preaching the gospel. I'm like, that's, that's going to read it, isn't it? Yeah. Did y'all read that? You read that, didn't mm -hmm. you? It's like, did you read that, Chris? I'll follow it. Yeah. It was, <laughs> it's like, but like, look, you, you're not, you're not, uh, if you ain't convinced there, I don't know what to say. But that strong desire to put the mark on your hand and everything else is gonna happen at the same time. I mean they they were so busy trying to say, do not take this this mark. So so I'd be curious to know what y'all if y'all when you get through this thing, I've been putting a lot of time on it. Yeah. Not, not necessarily see I've been studying the thing since back in December. Okay. Didn't really know why. Okay. <clears throat> but now I'm beginning to understand, see, next next Friday, I'm retiring. You what? Retirement. Really? My last day, next Friday, I'm going. Really? For the government? Yes, sir. Wow. You 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 know lunch and everything? Yes, sir. I'm gonna get in the book. <laughs> okay. Full time. Book. I'll be getting the book full time. Is it time? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> next Friday, that's it. Forty years, man. You hang your hat? I'm hanging it up. Wow. Wow. Congratulations, brother. Be careful. I felt some move when I said that. When I said that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A release. But uh, I, I'm really beginning now to, to, to really appreciate the glory of God's creation and the fact that I can think. You can think, man. God has created you with the capacity to think. Yeah. And your own, nobody can take that away from you. And what he wants you to do is go to think it. When you go to think about scripture, you're going to set yourself up. The moment you go to think about scripture, God says, I know that going to think about scripture. <laughs> you think about their book is. Because now you get God a chance to influence and begin yeah. to interrupt and get involved. And he'll come right in and go to move it in your thinking while you ain't really aware that he's got it. Mm. And involved. 
this is the beauty of it. This is what see that's why Robert Zachariah years ago, he got a magazine, he still published quarterly. Mm. You know what he called? Let my people think. What? Let's spin and let my people go. Let my people go let so they people, can't think. Let my, let my people go so they can't worship. Huh? Simple. Let my, let my people think. Yeah. Yeah. I say all the time, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him think. <laughs> to think! <laughs> you can't make him think. No, Ooh. sir. No, That's you interesting. That. Well, anyway, the, uh, to get a couple of scriptures before you leave, is the uh, cover letter says, chapter 1, introduce Revelation. We learn how and where John received the prophecy. This chapter also contained a large portion of the cover letter which John wrote to the seven churches of Asia. And it says here, first of all, hey, Jimmy, you take that if you don't mind. One through three. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. Is at hand. You know, and the thing, first of all, I said this is a revelation of Jesus Christ, which is there. Not John? It, no, this is of Jesus Christ. Any revelation of John? Yes. Yeah. And, look, and then look at it, it said, look, which God gave unto, God gave unto Jesus, which is interesting in itself, which God gave to him and showed his servants, that's us, things which must shortly come to pass. And when it means shortly, you're talking about when, when it starts happening. This is going to happen real fast. We well, know it's interesting things you said this morning mm -hmm. because um, the revelation of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. and I believe it's a, I believe this is a Jewish book. I believe that John John still wrote from a Jewish perspective. Mm -hmm. I believe right. Peter wrote from a Jewish perspective. Right. I think that Paul was the only really New Testament writer because the Bible teaches that he was he was something that was revealed to him. It was a mystery, something that was hidden. Yes, yeah, sir. That 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 what he wrote about. May not, in other words, you may say, I see a contradiction to some of the things that Paul said and what Peter and John said. Mm -hmm. And I would say there was not a contradiction mm -hmm. because they were writing from two different perspectives. perspectives. Yeah. You see what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. So yeah. I believe that Jesus Christ came the first time to reveal himself to his people. Mm -hmm. yes. And they didn't get what he was. Yes. So now we're talking about the revelation of Jesus Christ. I still believe he's trying to reveal himself to his people of who he was because these seven churches mm -hmm, mm -hmm. were actual churches in Asia Minor they which were, is yeah. modern day Turkey right and so but see another thing too John wrote to these seven churches mm-hmm do you realize that Paul wrote to seven churches as well he did what you Paul wrote to seven churches okay. seven Gentile churches John wrote to seven Jewish churches they both wrote to seven churches if you look at the 14 books that I believe Paul wrote including the book of um, Hebrews You'll see some of them were to individual, but seven of them was to churches. Yeah. So, so there's to the me there's a yeah. parallelism in there. Yeah. In that yeah. he was revealed to the Gentiles, he was also revealed to the Jews. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Gentiles accepted him, the Jews never did. Right. And so I believe this is him again letting them know this is the revealing of who I said he was, who I was. I came the first time when you rejected me and never accepted who I Deep. was. Yeah. So I do believe that, that we have to understand. And, I, and, I, and, I, and, and reading the Bible, I look at that a lot of times too. That there are some things that were revealed to, to Peter and John and some of the yeah. Jewish writers right. that was revealed to Paul. Paul got a message that he said that wasn't given to any of the rest of them. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. given to the rest yeah. of them. He, he some stuff was told to him yeah. that wasn't told to John, wasn't told to Peter. That wasn't revealed in the Old Testament. Yeah, it was. A, it was. It was by the revelation of Jesus Christ. It was a mystery. It was something different. Mm. And so, and so, therefore, I think people have to understand some things because you, you, you hear some groups of religious folks will tell you to to ignore the writings of Paul. That he that they they weren't that important. Or, or Paul wasn't really that true. Or Paul didn't really believe what he was saying on his own. Right. You have certain folks say a lot of different things because they don't understand what Paul received. From Jesus Christ, it was a revelation he got about this mystery, right. something totally different than the Jewish line that you can see 
through the Old Testament mm -hmm. and through some of even the New Testament writers. Mm -hmm. It was a it's a different it's different. Yeah. It's totally different. Well see that's interesting. Because one of the things I did in result of this study, I went back and retraced Paul's missionary journeys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in Paul's missionary journey, these are all the churches. No, 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 mm -hmm. no. Right. So why does John mm -hmm. take a subset mm -hmm. of the churches that Paul went to? Because this is a subset of the churches that Paul went to. Yeah. He 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 don't say nothing about Thessalonica. Mm -hmm. He does right, he don't. Right. He don't say nothing about the Corinthians? Uh-uh. Mm -hmm. But they, but these are not in the Asia Minor though. Right. But but right next to the Asia Minor is Galatia. Mm -hmm. Paul went there. Yeah. Got a letter to them. Right. They ain't in that John right to them. Right. So there has to be a reason why mm -hmm. this these seven churches are selected as the candidate to receive the letter. Are they are they wrong? Are they are they are they Jew? I hadn't considered that. That's a good point. But you, you do understand that. Up until now, or up until then, the Jews have been praying Christ as the, as the Messiah. Right. That, that you got these, you got these small messianic yeah, pockets all over yeah, the place. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. But the Jews mm -hmm. as a nation as still mm -hmm. had to embrace Christ as Savior. Right. As, as the Messiah. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, so one, as we get into this too, we're finding that these also, the names of these churches, what they actually, the meaning behind the names, Plays a role into it as well. What well, really got my attention to the world? Now that you're saying that, it first popped in my mind. In one of the churches, he said, Thou hast tried them who say they are Jews. And are Ooh! Now that, that, that locks in on you. And are not. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not. Why, that's, why, why, why is that even important? That, that's. <laughs> that's a good. You brought something good on that one, you're right. Mm -hmm. I think no one, no one mind even pointed out that. They were pointing out the, just, you know, you break down the names, and each of those names has some significance behind why he chose those particular Well, churches. you know, I, I think it's necessary, and, and Lee brought it out earlier, is that sometimes we can get so focused in on the, on the, on the specifics. You know, you're mm -hmm. getting granular. You're getting down yeah. to, the, to the granular aspect. Yeah. To the point that you miss the big picture. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, again... And I agree that any time you, you endeavor to read a book or to understand something, the first thing you need to do is understand the big picture. In other words, what the what and the why. Then you can start trying to get granular and dissect the details as to what specifically that particular thing means. But I think in most times when you read commentaries on the book of Revelation, it never really gives you an overall it's picture great, of yeah. what the great book is about. Yeah. It's, it's trying to tell you what, 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 you know, what each seal meant. And each yeah. So you're getting granular, you're just getting into details. And really don't have the big picture. And I, my propose that if you don't have the big pictures, mm. the small phase ain't going to make sense to you because you don't know where they fit. Until you see the big picture, big picture. you can't understand all the stuff that's inside. Yeah. So I think it's important that that, that an outline or, or at least yes. what is the purpose of the book? What is really he trying to convey to mankind? And where are we going with this? Why was it written? Why was it revealed, revealed, revealed to John? Why did he write it to these seven churches? Why that? Then once we understand the why of those things, then we can start talking about the details, and then they seem to fall in place and make sense. Since mm -hmm. I know why he did it, I see why he specifically dealt with it in this particular area. Otherwise, right. just dealing with the details yeah. a lot of times, That's right, people yeah. miss the big picture because they don't, they don't have any idea what the big picture is. Right. You know? but don't forget the fact is that, that Daniel, back to the prophets of Daniel, he mm -hmm. said that seven weeks... That that's dealing with that seven seven days seven mm -hmm, years mm -hmm. is dealing with Israel, absolutely. And and therefore absolutely. that falls back around. What absolutely. I'm saying is, hey, I'm going to go back. This is time I'm going to go deal with them, and I'm sending these letters because they rejected him. So again, he's coming. This is the revelation of Jesus Woo! Christ. Yes. Because yes. they rejected him when he came the first time. Right. But I mean, he's coming pretty clear this time mm. that I'm revealing myself, and so yes. they gonna have to. They gonna, They're not gonna have any choice but to accept the fact that he is who he said he was mm -hmm. because of the things that he's gonna do. Right. In this in, in this particular time frame, so it's interesting. Even say, you know, when you're talking about that, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Mm -hmm. He's gonna reveal himself to them. It really kind of strange to you think about this thing too, man. <clears throat> He, he comes back 
and he pulled one of the original 12. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I always thought it was interesting that while Jesus was here, he didn't write not one thing. Mm -mm. Yeah. I was like, come on, Jesus. No, <laughs> your, your whole ministry on earth. You ain't wrote not. Hello. Didn't write nothing. <laughs> nothing. He wrote on the ground one time. <laughs> and when he comes to Bible, he tells us what he wrote. Damn, I ain't got nothing. He tells us what he wrote. I ain't wrote. come to write nothing. <laughs> right. I come to live this thing out in front of y'all first. In front, yeah. Yeah. That's going to cause some stuff to happen later on. Yeah. But they choose one of the original now. So look here. Let me, let me, I'm, I'm, let me tell you. I'm going to give one more shot. He <laughs> did. <laughs> Now, it is interesting, he said, when he talked to John, he said, the fact that I'm going to signify. So he sent, to, he sent and signified it by an angel unto his servant John. Now, I don't get that part. Yeah. That's the only part that confused me. I didn't get that. So when he said churches, he talked to the body of Christ, is it probably if that's because he's My personal belief churches. is he's not talking about churches. I just think to translate the, straight, uh, mm -hmm. translate the churches is ecclesia. Which means called out ones, yeah. and I know at this particular time these were synagogues, these were Jewish, these were Jewish, mm -hmm. these were Jewish congregations. These weren't churches in the sense of what we would consider to be a New Testament church. Mm -hmm. So I really don't. I think I think the word church for the seven churches really. I don't think they were actual churches as we define and see the word church. I don't. I don't believe that. I mm -hmm. think that they were actually Jewish communities or Jewish congregations, and therefore I think it should probably be better translated. Synagogue, but called out ones. I mean, I mean, ecclesia is the word in Greek, so mm. it could be translated. I mean, because you know, you got to be careful because people say, I heard a guy say, Well, was there any mission of the church in the Old Testament? I said, No, there was no mission of the church in the Old Testament. They go back and say, Yeah, it was. And I remember someone in the New Testament talks about how Moses, something about the church, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying, in the Old Testament, yeah. but it really wasn't the church, it was just the called out ones, and it was translated church. And so sometimes we take what it was translated to and have that to cause us to think the meaning, confuse the meaning of what is being said because of the colloquialism, what we define the word that is today. Whereas in that day when they was coming through the red through the wilderness, there there was no quote unquote church as we know church. It was just a gathering of God's people, called out ones, mm. which they were the called the chosen ones, ecclesia. You could you you know it could be translated church. But I don't think it's the church as we would define church. That's just my opinion. That's a good, that's a good point, though. I'm so, sure so, 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 uh, uh, would, it is the word church, which is. It, so you you have you have the ecclesia, and then you have this word church, mm -hmm. and they both are pretty much kind of a synonymous terms in one sense. But listen. The, is the church set apart in our in its meaning by by virtue that it is talking about those in whom the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ, now dwells? Yeah, That's what I think. because it because it's talking about it's His body now. Yeah. Okay. So when you talk about Christ's work in the earth today, anytime you find anyone. Who has the spirit of Christ in him? They are they are inherently part of his body. Mm -hmm. they, and the word church is used mm -hmm. to talk about that. Yeah, that is interesting. Okay, but ecclesia simply means. Uh, I, I, you know, I, in, we did. A, I'm doing a study in Ephesians, and ecclesia is nothing but a variant of the word. Call. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I put it up there too. Places. Places uh, <laughs> is a. Yeah. Is a. A calling out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A popular out. meeting, especially yeah. a religious congregation, Jewish synagogue, or Christian community of members on earth, yes. or saints in heaven or both. Assembly. Mm -hmm. Church. And it's a church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's. Assembly of people. Yes. But I agree with you, church, when we say church, from what we would understand, church is in whom the which the Spirit of God dwells. Mm. Because because you couldn't have called uh, Come on now. you yeah. couldn't have called Old Testament saints. But most church. Of them, no, but you most of them had church because yeah. the Spirit of God did not reside on the inside of them. 
Now Paul t uses it mm -hmm. as, as symbol to yeah. say it has the components of what we now know. Mm -hmm. They were all one. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> it was an assembly. Yeah, because in, with, with us now, the Spirit of God dwells in every one of them, in every one of us. Yeah. And the oneness of the Godhead now, we now get a flavor of what it means when Jesus said, I pray that they all may be one. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Yes, sir. I and them and thou yes, and me, mm -hmm. that they all might be one enough. Come on. Mm -hmm. that, was a, that was shadowed in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. That was never realized. Exactly. Yeah. So there, there's, I, I mean, like the contingency of heaven, of, of heaven in earth. It's like this is the kingdom of God representation in earth. And that was the Old Testament Jews. Or mm -hmm. the, and then the New Testament is the body of Christ, mm -hmm. the church. So we are we looking at the same kingdom with just different manifestations. Yeah, That's right. yeah. That's That's right. You late, you late, you late, you late. I'm gonna blame it on. I'm gonna say, look, I'm trying to get out there. He's in here. Well, let me go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. God bless. Oh, God bless you. Look at your head dropped in there. Look here. Be hey, careful, hey, them deers, man. Hey, Jimmy threw oh, a Jimmy threw a grenade in there. <laughs> so wait a minute. I, I'm trying to uh, uh, explain something here. You're saying the spirit of God didn't didn't uh, 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 was it was it with no one in the Old Testament? Not didn't dwell on the inside of one. No one was born again. The spirit of God didn't dwell on the inside of. The spirit of God came up came on men. At times to perform a particular tasks and to do certain things, but the Spirit of God didn't dwell inside of no man. Mm -mm. Yeah. Mm -mm. Absolutely not. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, that was an empowerment that took us to another level of performance. Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> he didn't dwell inside of man until after his resurrection. Yeah. yeah. They were born again by the Spirit of God. Yeah. Then, they, then the Spirit was, then they had the Spirit of Him. But the Old Testament saints, the Old Testament prophets, the Old Testament folks, the Spirit of God didn't dwell on the inside of them. The Spirit of God came upon them. And then they were moved by the Spirit to do certain things, but no, they the Spirit of God didn't so dwell on the inside of them. Well, now He's on the inside of me. He, he we're, I'm like one with Him. Yeah. Uh, it was two separate mm -hmm. things, but then they just did it. Then sometimes they were empowered, so to speak, to do certain things. The Spirit of God came upon them, and they were empowered to do certain things. Whereas I think Christians now are empowered at all times, basically. Yeah. The Spirit of God is on the inside of them. Yeah. They're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. None of them, and I say it that way, none of them were indwelt. By the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God made it came up on them. Yeah. But now the Spirit of God dwells in us. He don't so, have so, to come up on us. I, I, so, uh, 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 like, uh, uh, say so, like people like Moses and mm -hmm. and, and uh, Elijah, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. they didn't have the Spirit of God on them all the time. On them, on them, yeah. on them, I would say on them. In them, I would say no. Once again, I'm like. So then what, uh, uh, I'm trying to get to the, uh, what? Go they ahead. weren't born again. That's it. Mom they they weren't born again. Born again. Okay. They weren't born again. <laughs> right. Because to be okay. born again, you had to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ. Obviously, that came futuristic. Yeah. 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 So they couldn't have been born again because Jesus Christ hadn't even came, died, and born again, and resurrected. Yeah. So they, they, in other words, so they weren't born again. Not right. to say that God didn't use them and empower them to do certain things or empower their lives for, for specific reasons to accomplish certain tasks. But but in the sense of being born again, I I I, yeah. I, I think yeah. the Bible teaches that they were not born again. I, I, I'm not saying they were born again. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that I, just, I, I just don't see the difference in what in what the, the what the Lord uh uh. Mm -hmm. If that 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 liquid right there in that thing, that's uh you can you throw stuff on top of that thing right there, and you can even put a cast around it, and it'll strengthen the exterior portion of it, or you can freeze what's in the liquid, and then the liquid itself becomes solid. What happens with us is that Christ came upon to empower. I mean, that Christ the Spirit of God would come upon somebody to empower them. But now that same Spirit that came upon them now dwells in you. It's like now you can drink this and it's, living, and it's inside of you. We receive Christ on the inside. We receive God living inside of us. The Word says, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have received with God. So when Lee's over there getting excited all the time about He's in there. He keeps saying he's in there. He's, he's telling the truth that God lives in us. The fellowship was restored because of what happened at, at Christ. I mean, we dwell in him. But you just, just said God lives in us. So uh, 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 where is this? I, I, I'm, I'm out of the feeling that God also lived in Moses and, 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 and the other, uh, and, and, and Elijah. Said, other ones, like, and you, you know, yes. But like you and I talk but you about said, But now if you're going to talk about Jesus. No, of course not, because he wasn't. He's physical. Right, right. right. Mm -hmm. 
But by the, when we think in terms of Jesus, the physical manifestation of, of, of the Father, he said he is the, he is manifest the image of the invisible God. Jesus is God in the flesh. But then the God in the spirit is the Holy Ghost living in you. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I so it's like, it's, like, it, it's like, it's different manifestations of the same person. Like if you went to the store, you want, if you went to a restaurant and wanted to drink cool, you wouldn't ask for water. You would ask for ice. Mm -hmm. And it would cool it. If you wanted to weaken it, you would ask for water. Because the application is different. And so with, with, with the Spirit of God, with God Himself, when He came to live in us, He came to live in the Spirit. But it's the same thing as if Jesus Christ Himself, the man Himself, was taking a residence inside of us. Except the one's a physical manifestation, the other's a spiritual. So now, God sees us from inside out. So when we go to him and say, I can't do that, he already knows the line because he's been able to do it through us. And that becomes the whole issue, I think, right now, is that it's not our work, it's the spirit that's working in us and through us that still manifests before people. So that's why it's necessary for us to crucify the flesh. And if you go back to that scripture,